Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and I would like to talk to you about demystifying performance. Back in 2014, I wrote a blog post about the in vogue in the L&D space was this vague notion of performance. Because back in 2014, the mention of performance in an L&D context seemed to be growing. However, the phrase performance consulting too often meant performance-based instruction. And I think there's a major difference. Now, while I'm all for performance-based instruction, when we talk about performance, we need to be thinking about uh, a greater set of enablers than simply the knowledge and skills. If we're trying to really improve performance, um, we need to understand what those variables are and how we might affect them. If the, our goal is to produce instruction or training or learning that's going to impact performance, well, that's a different thing. And we can do that. We still have to focus on the performance and what those performance requirements are. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about. Now, I want to go into my background. Uh, back in 1979, in August, I started my first job out of college in a training function for Wix Lumber in Saginaw, Michigan. And the colleagues that I was working with were brand new to the organization. They had been there just about two weeks uh, longer than I had. And they had come from Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit, Michigan, and where they had worked alongside of people who were related to some of the big gurus of the field. And I'm and and they were they had they were working with uh, Gary Rumler's brother, uh, the late Gary Rumler now, and uh, his business partner, Tom Gilbert, and also they had been influenced by other people that were big names back at the time and that then became big influences for me, which included Bob Mager and Joe Harless, to just name a few. Now, I was given three things on my first day on the job, and one of them was a newsletter from 1970, September and October of 1970, that talked about guidance, the short way home. And what was that was all about was really job aids or what I nowadays call performance guides that really instruct the performer on the job tasks to be done to produce an output that's of worth. So a worthy output. The second thing I was given, uh, but I read that the first day. And then the second thing I was given was this book by Bob Mager and Peter Pipe, Analyzing Performance Problems, or You Really Ought to Want to. And I I was living at a hotel. Uh, my life hadn't caught up to me yet. And so I had plenty of free time that evening. And I read that book. And I was so excited about that book that I bought four copies of it and sent them to my four best friends from college who all wrote me back. This was 1979. So they wrote me back and I got it in the U.S. mail. Uh, thank yous, basically, that was said the equivalent of, you know, what the hell is this? Uh, so they obviously hadn't read the book and it hadn't had the impact to them that it had to me about how to look at performance and focus on performance and analyzing problems that might exist in the performance context. Same thing with uh, opportunities within the performance context. You can use the same kind of diagnostic tool to look at, you know, how do you address an opportunity as well as a problem. The third thing that I was given that very first day was the book that had come out the year before from Tom Gilbert, who was one of the co-authors of that Praxis report. The, the Praxis was the consulting firm of Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert back in those days. And Human Competence was Tom's book and uh, was just very influential to me about, again, how to look at performance and instruction, training, learning. Those are all means to the ends of performance and imp performance improvement or sustaining performance. And these were really critical resources to me. So, it, but it took me three times to get through that uh, Gilbert book because it was not a necessarily an easy read. Now, something I was giving the the very next few days in that very first week was a four hundred and some page binder uh, that was uh, Praxis workshop materials from nineteen seventy two, and on page four o four were was the, these two paragraphs and it said the first thing that a performance incorporated 
uh, person does in making a performance analysis is determine and describe the ideal or the desired performance of the employees. Um, that's very different than how people were typically approaching analysis for instructional purposes, for training purposes, for learning purposes back in those days. They didn't start by describing all of the activities that the employee could be engaged in, the various tasks and steps or steps and tasks, but rather by identifying major accomplishments or outputs, the results of the activity of the job. So your focus was initially on what are the outputs to be produced. Then the performance requirements and the expectations or standards for each output are identified and recorded. Next, the actual performance is compared to the desired to look for gaps, identifying areas that require further analysis and action. Now, in 1982, I became a consultant. I began developing my own models and, and language for describing the kind of work that I was doing because I had been adopting and mostly adapting things from others that I had learned from. And so they didn't all fit together. They didn't all use the same language. So I began to cobble together my own. And performance competence is the phrase that I use. And I define that as the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. Now, I use the word performance and competence deliberately. I could have called it performance capability, which would have been the equivalently the same, but I was borrowing the word competence from Gilbert's book, Human Competence. And one of the things that you got to know when you're doing this is, so what are the stakeholder requirements, which means you have to know who are the stakeholders for this performance. And they sit in judgment as to whether or not something is being done competently or not. So one of the big issues, one of the big arguments I've been engaged in over the years is the difference between outputs and outcomes. And outcomes are what we're really going for ultimately, but we can't practice producing outcomes, but we can practice producing uh, outputs. But outcomes are when our outputs, which are inputs downstream, meet or do not meet the stakeholder requirements. I mean, a good outcome is when your product that you've produced, your output produced, meets the regulatory requirements. If it doesn't meet the regulatory requirements, well, that's an outcome, but not a desirable outcome. Same thing when you look at the process that you use, it can either meet the regulatory requirements or not. And so there are two outcomes there, a positive and a negative. And so we can begin to talk about outcomes, but what the heck are they? Usually this is kind of a fuzzy notion. And so to me, it's really about the outcome is when the stakeholder requirements are met or not. And that requires, again, understanding who are the stakeholders and what do they require. And if there's any conflict between the stakeholders, resolving and balancing out those requirements to reduce or eliminate all of the conflicts. So my real focus, like the paragraph from the 1972 binder of Praxis workshop materials, it was about outputs. And Gilbert sometimes called these accomplishments. And in fact, in the human competence book, he really kind of went to that kind of language. But I worked with Gary Rummler for a couple of years after my first job uh, when I was at Motorola and he was one of the consultants serving there. And I kind of focused in on outputs. Motorola was also big into the whole total quality management movement uh, and all the tools and, and lessons learned from Durand and Deming and uh, Philip Crosby and other quality gurus. And outputs was more or less the language from the total quality management. Movement. So I kind of use that because that made sense in my context at Motorola at the time. And uh, but one of the things that I learned from Gary Rumler and from uh, his uh, buddy, the late Dale uh, Breathauer, who they both went to the University of Michigan together and were, were very good friends throughout their lives. Um, outputs are inputs downstream, and it's either an input to an internal or an external customer. 
And these are all the result of task performance, machine tasks and or human tasks. Uh, regardless, tasks or steps, as they're sometimes called, are used to produce outputs. And they, again, are inputs downstream. And that's why the customer is one of the stakeholders that you would look at uh, to determine whether or not that output, which is their input, was worthy or not. But there's other stakeholders besides them. Now, the tasks that are performed within the process, if you will, or the work stream, if you will, or what's nowadays called workflow, tasks or steps are performed, and they're either, again, machine tasks or human tasks or a combination of them. And what's tricky about tasks is that there are two types. There are the behavioral tasks, which we can see and we can count and we can measure uh, they're very overt, but there's also in parallel with the behavioral tasks, there's cognitive tasks that happen before, during, and after the behavioral tasks. It's the thinking tasks that have to be done in to that parallel, you know, the behavioral tasks. The tricky part is though, we cannot see, we cannot count, we cannot measure the cognitive tasks, we cannot measure people's thinking and know exactly what they are thinking so that we can share that with others who need to learn how to perform those tasks to produce those outputs to the stakeholder requirements. Once we understand the outcomes that we're going, looking for and what are the outputs and the measures for those and what are the tasks and the measures of those, we can begin to do a gap and cause analysis. And again, we would start with the outcomes that we were going to strive for and whether or not we're meeting them or not. And either there's a gap or there isn't. If there's a gap, it's because the output isn't meeting the requirements of the various stakeholders or a stakeholder. And so we can pinpoint and identify that gap. And then we can begin to do cause analysis to see, well, is the task performance itself adequate? Is the processes themselves adequate? Um, and if those are adequate, if the process has been designed and has been executed, uh, to produce worthy outputs, well, then we need to look elsewhere for why is the gap, why is the output not meeting the requirements? And we can begin to look at two sets of enablers, um, and those would be to look at the environmental enablers and the human enablers. Now, one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rumler was to focus initially on the process itself. I recall him saying in 1981 uh, at Motorola, this is captured on a video, that he would start with the process. Uh, I forget exactly what words he used for that, but basically that's the source for most of the problems. It's the process itself. The second area he would look at wouldn't be the human uh, and their enablers. He would look at the environment. And in particular, he would call out the consequence system as usually being at fault. Um, we, we sometimes reward people for the uh, wrong behaviors and we punish the right behaviors. And maybe those uh, consequence systems need to be re-engineered to reinforce and extinguish what we really want reinforced and what we want extinguished. But I would look at the uh, various uh, environmental enablers. And this is kind of an adaptation now of the Ishikawa diagram from Japan in the 1950s, part of the quality movement, uh, influenced heavily by Deming and Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model, which was in that 1978 book that I referenced earlier on human competence. Um, and so this is my mashup of those two models, if you will. And the third thing that I would look at would be the human enabler. So as Rumler would have said, we're going to give the human the benefit of the doubt. And we're going to look at the processes first, then we're going to look at the environment second, and we're going to look third, lastly, at the human element of performance to see if there's issues there. And these are the attributes, if you will, that the human brings to the performance party. They bring awareness, knowledge, and skills. They bring their physical, psychological, and intellectual attributes, and they bring their personal values. And neither of those are uh, conducive to what the process needs 
or they are not. Either they are adequate to what the process needs or they are not. Same thing with the environmental enablers. They are either adequate to the needs of the process or they are not. Now, when we look at the process itself, we've got to understand whether or not it is capable of producing outputs that meet those stakeholder requirements. And can it do it both effectively and efficiently? And of course, the important thing is to go for effectiveness first and then work on efficiency second, because what good is efficiency if it's not being effective? Um, one of the issues typical of processes is that they are overly designed or they are not designed at all. They're either loosey-goosey because nothing really exists. There is no process. People do it differently on Tuesday than Wednesday than Thursday. And so one of the things we need to look at in our process is, is it as rigorous as it required? And is it also as flexible as feasible? Sometimes our processes are too rigid and they inhibit performance and producing outputs that meet the stakeholder requirements because we're rigorously following some dict set of dictates that's not flexible in meeting the situational requirements or situational variables that, that the performers are contending with. The second thing, again, is the environmental enablers. And we can begin to look at, well, their provisioning system. So where does the information and data come from? Is it one source? Is it a multitude of sources? Same thing with the materials and supplies and the tools and equipment. And then there's also, does the organization, does the function that uh, owns the process and operates the process, is it got enough dollars or monetary resources to... Uh, operate correctly? Does it have the budget and the headcount, which is usually, you know, full-time equivalent employees, if you will, um, uh, from a headcount budget? So do they have the financial resources necessary to operate and, and be conducive to the demands of the process? And are there facilities and grounds issues? Does it need to be in a clean room? Does it need to be at a certain temperature, et cetera, et cetera? And then, of course, there's the culture and the consequence system. And I put those two together because I truly believe that the consequence system is a direct output of the culture uh, and, and what it is, how we do things around here and what we tolerate and what we don't tolerate. And too often we tolerate things we shouldn't and we don't tolerate uh, things that we actually should. Um, next on the human enablers, lastly, uh, do they provide their outputs to the process both effectively and efficiently? And so this is my configuration. Now, this looks typically like uh, the things that human resources or personnel uh, organizations and functions would own within an enterprise. Um, but but they're not necessarily always owned by HR. So one needs to be uh, careful and look at the situation that they're facing and determine, well, where are who is responsible for organization and job redesign or staffing and succession planning systems? You know, where are we getting the people from off the streets, elsewhere in the company? How does all that work? Is that it really in control? Uh, so therefore, we know where we want to do the recruiting and we can make a final selection of people uh, that, that meet our needs and we can train and develop them uh, further to so that they're performance competent, et cetera. Uh, these are all the aspects of what affects the human enablers for the people that we have in place in the processes. And either they meet the needs of the process adequately or not. This suggests perhaps that learning may not be the solution to a client's performance problem. True. Now, the the client could come to you with a request for learning and development because they have new hires. Well, okay, duh, yeah, then they would need to have some learning and development or training and development or instruction to prepare them to become performance competent. But if the client has come to you because their request is really rooted in a performance problem and or opportunity, uh, then it may not be uh, linked back, driven by a knowledge and skill deficit. And so again, here's where my fishbone model uh, can help us really begin to look at the process or processes themselves and the various environmental and human enablers.
Uh, that's why as analysts in, in instructional system design or a learning experience design effort, uh, we need to go beyond asking what people need to do and what they need to know. We need to understand the performance context that they work in and whether that's adequate or not. If we produce the most stellar learning experience and it doesn't solve the problem that the requester had, then we've done a disservice to the requester, we've done a disservice to the employees, the performers, and we've done a disservice to the shareholders because we have squandered shareholder equity. When I go to document this kind of data, uh, performance data, uh, I'll share an example here. This is from a project that I did back in 2004. My client had done a Six Sigma effort. The first thing we did was to configure the, what I call areas of performance. Now, they're also known as major duties, key results areas, accomplishments, et cetera. There's lots of different ways to segment the process performance or the performance uh, within the scope of our assignments. And so that's the nature of this. Now, I was looking at a, a process that had many different types of jobs in it. So it wasn't based on a job or a job family and the whole job or the whole, whole set of responsibilities of the job family uh, or, or just a, a, a set of outputs and tasks. It was about looking at this major complicated process. It was really a global process. And that's the nature of that. So the first thing we did was to segment it into its various chunks, what I like to call areas of performance. And then we developed performance model charts for each one of those chunks. There was one or more pages for each one of the areas of performance. And that was used to capture data about the key outputs and how they are measured going back to well, you know what are the stakeholder requirements for these outputs and what are the key tasks that are performed. And then we did some role responsibility matrices in the middle of this chart to identify who's responsible for doing the various tasks. Where are people performing in isolation and where are they performing collaboratively together? And what are the various responsibilities that each person might have in a collaborative effort? Then we can do a gap analysis against that. What are the typical performance gaps? Where do the measures of the outputs, uh, where are they not being met in the performance uh, current state and or in some imagined future state? You know, what are these issues that we could be having regarding performance? And then what are some of the probable causes and which of those causes then can be attributed back to the process itself? the environmental enablers, uh, and the human enablers. And because I'm coming at these things from a training or instruction or learning and development perspective, I've uh, kind of set out uh, a deficit of knowledge and skills because I need to show my client that sometimes it's not about the knowledge and skills that are at deficit. There's other human enablers that might be the cause. So there's many ways to carve this out and to document all of this. And this is just what I have evolved over the years. And these formats go actually back into the early 80s. Now, I ask a set of questions about this for analysis. And uh, for ideal analysis of the current state, we may have master performers in the current state and others who are not master performers. And so master performers set the benchmark, if you will, for performance. And these are the kinds of questions that I would ask to identify you know, the, the specifics of the areas of performance, the outputs and the measures and standards if they exist, and what are the various tasks performed, and then who, what are the various roles and responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis those tasks. Uh, that helps me capture the data that I need in the performance model chart about the ideal performance. But then I can do a gap analysis against that, where I can begin to look at the outputs produced and those measures and identify what are the typical performance gaps. You know, not something you know, once every three blue moons or for every 40 some years, but what are the typical day in and day out or cycle, process cycle issues that people struggle with? Can we identify those things and can we then attribute them to a particular cause so that can we work on the root causes rather than on the symptoms? When I train people on my methodologies here, I would share these questions with them, but say that 
these are my questions, guys' questions. You can't use them when we do the practice exercises. You're going to have to come up with your own version of guys' questions. And so I make everybody rewrite these and so that they can better internalize these. But they also have their questions, their version of how to ask these questions, and they have mine as a backup. What I learned a long time ago is that sometimes you need to ask the question in different ways in order to connect with the person you're asking so they can give you the answer that you're looking for. Um, and so we've got to be a little bit more flexible. We can't just have a set of rogue questions and ask them and expect to get the answers. That's not how it works. Then when I can, because I'm talking about performance in an L&D context, I need to document the enabling knowledge and skills. Now, if you remember the fishbone diagram, awareness, knowledge, and skills was one of the sets of human enablers. I have 17 different categories of enabling knowledge and skills that have evolved from way back in the early 80s when I had eight different categories. Um, and we'll look at this list a little bit more complete. But for each one of these categories that we'll use, not all of them are used in each project, I would identify per the category, what are the various knowledge and skill items? Where in the areas of performance do they impact? What do they enable? Because there's times when certain knowledge and skills would enable some of the areas of performance, but not all of them. And then I can gather additional data about the uh, each knowledge and skill item as a discrete thing uh, to know to help me prioritize and to help me organize that content later on. These are my 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills. And if you look at the first three, the company policies and procedures, practices and guidelines, and then two, laws, regulations, codes, agreements, and contracts, and three, industry standards. Well, these are the rules that people must comply with when they're doing that work. Um, so those could have all been collapsed into rules that we must comply with when we're doing the work. But I try to tease out more specific because sometimes company policies are different than company procedures. There may be also a set of practices. There may be a set of guidelines. So I'm using the labels of the enabling category uh, to help me tease out as 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 more as granular as possible. What do people need to know? in order to be able to do, do the tasks that produce the outputs that'll help us meet the uh, stakeholder requirements and then have outcomes that are desirable. And But there's this whole list here. And again, I don't use uh, the whole list for each and every project. I have on a couple occasions, but I've been doing this and using this list on several hundred projects here since 1982 when I became a consultant. And one of the things that I would warn you about is that you would derive the enablers of knowledge and skills under each one of these categories. You wouldn't use this list to simply brainstorm them. You would go back to the performance data and look at the first area of performance and the outputs and measures and tasks and roles and responsibilities and the typical deficiencies and the probable gap causes, and then begin to then brainstorm the various knowledge and skills category by category. And so if I had 10 um, areas of performance to look at, I would have revisited the 17 uh, categories perhaps 10 different times. And I'd be looking and trying to derive the list of uh, knowledge and skill items for each area of performance. And it, it, it's very systematic. It allows me to derive these and to have confidence of the completeness and accuracy of my list of enabling knowledge and skills. And it doesn't mean that it, what I produce would be perfect, but I'm going to have the vast majority of what's needed to be known in order to be able to perform, which, of course, is the goal of learning and development. Now, this is my adaptation of the ADDIE model, and I've changed it slightly, as you can see here. When I'm doing my analysis efforts, I'm really looking at four specific types of analysis. I want to know about the target audience and what I can safely assume and can't assume about the target audience. You know, what do they already know from their prior education and experiences is the key thing, but also 
Uh, where do they work? Uh, do, what resources do they have? What's their learning environment versus their performance environment? Is the same desk and computer or in a noisy room or are they working remotely from home? Are they on the road working most of the time, et cetera, et cetera. So I need to understand a lot of the demographics data about the target audience. But what I really need to know, bottom line, is what do they already know based on their experiences? And then later on, I'm going to want to know about, so are all of their job assignments the same or do they vary and understand those variances so we can configure content and modularize the content to best fit the needs of the learners who are performers. And I want to look at that performance data that we've already reviewed and understand the outputs and the tasks, et cetera. And I want to understand what are the enabling knowledge and skills. And when I have those three sets of data, I can begin to look at existing content that the client's shareholders have already paid for. They bought it or they've built it. And I need to look at that to see about its reuse potential. Can I reuse it as is or after modification? Or is it not applicable? It sounds like it should fit, but it doesn't. Until we looked under the cover and and took a harder look at well, what does it really cover, and how well does it cover it? It may sound it may have sounded from its title as a perfect fit, and when we looked at it, it's not a fit at all. All of this helps me to reach what I call the L and D pivot point. When my client comes to me with a request. I honor that request and I take their order and I do my project planning and I kick off my project with my client and other stakeholders. And then I conduct an analysis generating the kind of data that we've just reviewed. And then I can inform the client's business decision making uh, at the end of the analysis phase as to whether or not we should continue developing learning and development, or we should pivot to some other uh improvement intervention set, or should we do both? And I've had clients stop projects when we were going to develop instruction uh, for them, and they looked at the data and said the none of the gaps are caused by knowledge and skill deficits. And I said, yeah, that's what the data shows. You have to go fix your processes, and there's other environmental factors and you may need to develop additional instruction after you put new things in place, but really the major causes of your issues are don't have anything to do with addressing knowledge and skills. So continuing down the track to develop instruction or training or learning isn't going to address your problem and resolve it. And so it's a business decision to continue or not. And I've had clients who looked at the data and said, yeah, it's success, but we're going to continue to do the instruction because we've got a whole bunch of new hires that we're going to bring on board. I guess we didn't talk about that earlier guy, but that's why we need to continue and develop the instruction. And we're also going to have to make these other fixes, which means we're going to have to then go and update the instruction whenever we've put those in place. So, but those are business decisions. These are investment decisions that our clients should be making, and we should not be making those. Back in 1984, I was a co-author with my two business partners on the our first uh, description of our PACT analysis methodology. And PACT is simply uh, my branding for my instructional systems design and now learning experience design methodology set. So it's how I do analysis and design and the whole rest of the addy like uh, process that I shared with you and how I do project management of all of that. But uh, so this was back in 1984. It was published in NSPI's Performance and Instruction Journal. Uh, NSPI is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. That same year, we published another article in Training Magazine, and this was about the application of that kind of data used in a curriculum architecture design. And this was the first published article on curriculum architecture. Uh, I've also, uh, with those business partners from the uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, we wrote the Quality Roadmap, which was our attempt to share with our clients and others how we saw the combination of total quality management and human performance technology. 
And within human performance technology is instructional technology, if you will. Technology being a word that met, used to mean uh, the application of science and not computer and digital hardware kinds of things and software. Um, but this was our book from 1994 about performance improvement consulting. And this was my 99 book on Lean ISD, uh, where I documented all of my processes and my practices. Uh, this was to uh, augment a series of workshops that I was doing for my clients back at the, back in those days. Um, I've written over 30 books in total, and we're going to go to the next set. More recently, in 2020, I wrote this Conducting Performance-Based Instructional Analysis in Every Phase of an Instructional Development Effort. So I don't do analysis in the analysis phase exclusively. I do it in my project planning and kickoff phase. I do it in my analysis phase, my design phase, my development phase, and in my pilot testing phase. I've extracted pilot testing from development because uh, it's usually seen as a, a, a one of the types of development testing that one might do of their content as they're producing it. Um, but I've extracted that so I could make a bigger deal out of it with all of my clients. But this is all about performance-based instruction. I use the term instruction because I believe that uh, performance guides are instructional. Same thing, job aids and performance support and electronic performance support system. They are instructional in nature or should be. And the the uh, learning experience designs, well, those should be instructional as well. We need to be instructing people on how to perform back on the jobs so that they can have the competence and the confidence to go back to the job and apply what they've learned. And if they're not applying what they've learned, the our efforts have fallen short somehow, some way. Um, but this book from 2022 on epi thinking enterprise process performance, this relates to my view of basically total quality management or what I would call performance improvement consulting. I think performance improvement consulting is different than performance consulting as many people talk about it, because when they're talking about performance consulting, they're talking about performance based performance oriented learning and development content. And that's fine. That's needed. That's the best kind of uh, learning content or training content or instructional content is that that is focused on performance. But my view is I need to help my clients understand when uh, learning and development is not going to resolve their issues. And I need to go beyond looking at just simply what are the performance-based requirements of knowledge and skills that can be packaged then into learning and development products. The focus is on performance requirements and how to enable them. I hope this is useful and actionable for you in your performance context. Thank you.